Christian nationalism or global trannyism. Those are the choices. Christian nationalism or the global homo jihad. Those are the choices. I think what we keep forgetting in this discussion is that it is not whether but which. It is not whether but which. Today, I'm going to be talking about Christian nationalism. I'm going to be defining my terms as a Baptist. I'm going to be doing so particularly from a 1689 London Baptist, Second, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith position as someone who is covenantal, as someone who is reformed, as someone who is presuppositional rather than a Thomist, a.k.a. God wrote a book. I'm a fan of the book. Natural revelation, natural law, arguing from reason is perfectly fine. I understand the position, but I am a presuppositionalist. Stephen Wolfe is a Thomist. I'm going to argue from my position, not his. I'm also going to be arguing from a Kuyperian standpoint, all of Christ for all of life as a general equity theonomist. Again, general equity theonomist, which is perfectly compatible with the 1689. The general equity of the civil codes still remains. It has to be properly applied with prudence, but it remains even for New Testament times, this church age. And I'm also going to be arguing for Christian nationalism from a Baptist perspective with a post-millennial eschatology. That's my position. But from the outset, before defining my terms and theologically showing you the path in which I take to get underneath this Christian nationalist banner that I don't even really want to advocate for myself, I would rather simply just say, hey, I'm of the mere Christendom sort. That's much more my position. Doug Wilson, his kind of, his vein, a mere Christendom sort and just a general equity theonomist. Um, but Christian nationalism, I didn't pick it out of a hat. It wasn't my choice for a label. But that's the debate that's going on right now. And I'm willing to wear the label because you, can, <laughs> you either have Christian nationalism or globo transeism. You're going to have global homo jihad. Um, you're going to have progressive godless globalism or Christian nationalism. It again, again, it's not whether but which. Let me say this, and then we'll go ahead and dive in. I'll give a couple of announcements up front. I would rather have a Christian government that is arguing and debating over what the proper institution of Sabbath laws are than a government that is arguing and debating over what age we should sexually mutilate children. That's what I think guys keep forgetting in this discussion. They're, they're arguing um, as though the choice is between Christian nationalism and something else that we, they forget that this something else, that this classical liberalism idea is something that we no longer have. So they're arguing as though the, the two choices are Christian nationalism or this, this just wonderful freedom that everybody has and we're all respectful about it. Those aren't the two positions. We need to argue between Christian nationalism on the one hand and, and then the other actual real viable option that we currently have, which is insanity, Christ or chaos. What I'm arguing, when I say Christian nationalism, um, I know that there are going to be some challenges. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying that there will be no casualties. I'm not saying that there won't be mistakes making. I, I, I'm not saying any of that. Yeah, you're going to have to figure out blasphemy laws. But I would rather have a debate about how to, to figure out Christian blasphemy laws and what those penalties are and what the lines are what, what, what is outside the bounds and what's permissible? I'd rather have the debate about blasphemy laws from a Christian standpoint than, than from a woke CRT, intersectionality, transgender, baby murdering, abortion standpoint. Again, here's the key as we go into this conversation. It is not whether, but which. 
That's what I think a lot of our brothers keep forgetting. It's not whether you have blasphemy laws, but which ones. You will, in any society, you will be canceled for certain kinds of speech. You will. So the question is, which kinds? Not whether or not something is off limits that you're not allowed to say, but which things are off limits. You will penalize someone. You will legislate some form of morality. The question is, by what standard? By what standard? So yes, I would rather have Christian nationalism, which will have a host of complexities and arguments and problems and challenges and failures. I will admit that. There will be failures. But, but here's what we're trying to beat right now. Right? There, there'll be failures. He just admitted it. That there'll be failures with Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. There will be. But it will be a vast improvement from the failure of 60 million dead babies. That's what we're trying to work from right now. I think we're forgetting the starting place. We're forgetting what time it is. The sons of Issachar, they knew the times. See, there were some dear brothers in the Lord, and they are brothers. They're not heretics. They are brothers. I think they're wrong, but they're brothers. But they're advocating that we go back to a certain form of culture and government and political thinking, but that what they don't realize is that it's something that, that never really was viable in and of itself. It had the thin veneer, the optic, the visual of viability and working because classical liberalism appeared to work for a long period of time, but in the scope in history, a very brief period of time because it was riding off the fumes of a prior Christendom. Some of the things that are being presented right now. See, that's the thing. You've got guys in the body of Christ saying, we don't like Christian nationalism. We don't like post-millennialism. We don't like theonomy. Uh, we don't like Christians wielding political power in this way or that way. But they're not presenting another solution. And if they are, it's not serious. It's not serious. It's just saying we see a problem with Christian nationalism. We want to warn people about the problems and the potential danger we see with Christian nationalism without presenting any alternative. And the, the alternative that occasionally might get presented falls squarely within this classical liberalism category, not recognizing that that appeared to work and for a relatively long period of time, decades, over a century, arguably, depending where you count. But again, it worked because we had a generally moral population. We don't have that, guys. Brothers, sisters in the Lord, Baptists and Pietist Presbyterians of the Westminster Escondido sort, all of you, please, I, I'm begging you. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to do hashtag based stuff right now. I am begging you as a brother in Christ, wake up. You need to know what time it is. We live now and only spiraling increasingly all the more in a negative world, not a neutral one, a negative world, a hostile world. And if we refuse to fight, if we refuse to wield the little bit of influence we still have left, the little bit of power and political will that Christians still have. I, I think that history will look back and say that, that we made one of the most foolish mistakes within church history that has ever been made in Western civilization. I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to sabotage the future of my own grandchildren. 
the world is becoming hostile. Certain principles that appeared, again, they had the veneer, the optic of viability in the past, not that long ago, just a few decades ago. They only appeared to be viable because under, under the hood, what you had in Western civilization, especially in America, was a generally moral population. Not each and every individual I'm speaking in terms of groups that the overarching population of America just a few decades ago had a general sense of morality. Not perfect, but a general sense of morality. It is not the 1950s anymore. And you can't get back there. You, you, you can't. The 1950s only happened... Where, where, where did they come from? Where, where did this time period come from? Let's get that again. Well, what it came from is the 1950s is just a very brief moment in time as Christendom is eroding. You don't get the 1950s back by shooting for, setting your sights, your aim, right? You don't set your sights on the 1950s to get the 1950s back. You have to set your sights on the scripture, all of Christ for all of life. You have to set your sights on, on Christian government, Christian society, Christian culture, the immutable, unchanging, and perfect standards of God's law. That, that's, you have to shoot for that. And by God's grace, if he would be so kind, achieve that. The 1950s wasn't an achievement. It, it was a brief window as two ships in the night were slowly passing by each other. One, rank paganism and wickedness. Paganism and wickedness. The other, Christendom. And as this one was going out to sea and this one was coming in to the dock, there was a brief moment where they both passed by. And you had the appearance, a brief appearance, that neutrality was viable. But that neutrality isn't something that has its own foundation. It's not something that you can shoot for and achieve. That neutrality is merely the appearance of a neutrality that only occurs in the big scope of things very briefly. And it occurs only when one God is on his way out and a new God is on his way in. When the true triune God is on his way out and a nation is on their way of apostatizing and the new gods, which is really just the rise of the old gods, are on their way in. And when you're at that halfway point where there's still some Christendom left, but there's some paganism coming in, that's where you get the appearance, the brief optic of neutrality. It's not an indefinite position. It's not a viable position. It's not a long-standing position. It doesn't work. It's just a moment. It's just a moment. Because these two other things, something's happening there. Christendom and paganism. Christendom and paganism. If we want, if we want a moral country, if, if we want a nation that, that isn't trying to sexually mutilate children and, and murder babies in the womb and all kinds of, of atrocity and wokeism and critical race theory and intersectionality and um, all these different things... You, you don't cast out that degree of darkness um, with, with a less degree of darkness. You don't cast out the dark with dusk. You, you cast out the dark with dawn, the rising of the new sun. You cast out darkness with light. So sentiments of, you know, like Scott Annual. One of his recent tweets of, where he said, I want to see more Christians in government. Good. I like that. But then he goes on to say, I want to see more Christians in government so that we can stop 
wicked laws, pagan laws, but not so that we can legislate and execute Christian laws. And that was it. That's the idea. That, that's, that's his point. That, that is deeply concerning. That is deeply concerning. Let me break that down. It's simple, but let me break it down. He's saying, okay, fine. Christians can be in government. That's a good thing. I'll concede that point. And we'd like to have, while we're at it, the more the merrier, lots of Christians, real Christians, not just nominal Christians, but solid Christians in government. Praise God. But to what end? To stop the pagan nonsense, not to legislate Christian righteousness. Now, again, let, let, me, let me rephrase it now so you can see what's being said. He's saying, I want Christians in positions of authority and power so that they can cast out darkness. But I want them to do it without using light. I want Christians to cast out darkness, even at a civil level, in the civil sphere. But you're not allowed to cast out darkness. You, you, you do whatever you want to cast out darkness, and you got to get it done. The one thing you're not allowed to use, though, is light. That's where we are in the debate. So I want to frame the debate again from the outset. It's not whether, but which. The reason why this whole Christian nationalism conversation is on the rise, again, because some we're forgetting, we're getting bogged down in some of the details. Um, we're, 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 you know, emotions are, are tight and high and people are, you know, are, are, are being a little bit rude. And, and there's even been some ways that I could have worded things better myself personally. I'm willing to admit that. But I think we're forgetting how we got here. Why are people talking about Christian nationalism? Why weren't they talking about it even just five years ago? What happened in the last three years to spur on such a discussion? Why am I hosting the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference and we sold out six months in advance? I'm not a big name. I'm not a celebrity. I've got a few thousand views, you know, <laughs> followers on YouTube. Uh, that's about it. Why, why are people coming out of the woodworks to, to entertain something like theonomy or postmillennialism or Christian nationalism? Because the West lost its mind. That's why. So again, from the outset, framing this conversation, remember, remember why we're having this conversation. They're killing babies, guys. They're castrating boys, guys. They're tearing down monuments. They set the nation on fire, literally, in mostly peaceful protest in the summer of love 2020 joe biden is our president dylan mulvaney went to the white house they're doing pride parades in thongs with dildos there's drag queen Story hour for kids in public libraries. And we want to talk about how God's law and theonomy is dangerous. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> I feel like R.C. Sproul, what's wrong with you people? What's wrong with you? They're transing kids. And we want to talk about whether or not we should use God's law. Yeah, there are problems. I get it. I, I'm aware of church history. I'm aware of what the Pado baptist did to the Credo baptist I am. And it's serious. And I'm not making light of it. I'm aware. Cutting out tongues. Putting, putting ministers, faithful ministers of the gospel in a little dark hole. 
I'm aware of the Spanish Crusades. I am aware that abuse is entirely possible. In fact, I, I would go further and say that it's not just possible, it's inevitable. But again, here, here's the framework for this whole conversation, guys. It's not whether, but which. We're not arguing between the 1950s. Would we rather have the 1950s or Christian nationalism? We don't have the 1950s. What I'm considering theologically, pastorally, as a father, as a husband, what I'm considering right now it is not, I'm not considering um, the choice between the 1950s and theonomy. I'm considering the choice between Christian nationalism and tranny globalism. That's the debate. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. We are moving in to a negative, not neutral. That was a brief moment in time Two ships passing at sea, one going out, one coming in, one being Christendom leaving and the other paganism arriving. And when those ships overlapped, it was a brief moment in time that gave the momentary veneer optic of neutrality. But that is not a long-standing viable position. It will either be the Christian God or the old pagan gods returning. Jesus cast out a demon and he said, when a demon is cast out, it goes through waterless places, arid places. But if it comes back and returns and finds that the house has been swept clean and put in order, but it's empty, it will bring with it seven other demons, more evil and terrible than itself. And the latter state of the man will be far worse than the former. Do you know what Christ does? He cast out demons. He binds the strong man. And that's what he did in Israel during his earthly ministry. Israel was full of demons because they were living in rebellion and unbelief toward God. And Jesus arrives on the scene and he's casting out demons left and right. And this works with individuals. The principle also applies for societies, for nations. Christ in America cast out demons. He did. Christendom, what it does, just like Jesus in his earthly ministry, because it is Jesus, it's his truth, his gospel, his law, his principles. What Christendom does is it comes, whether it be with an individual or or society, it comes and it removes the demons. And I'm talking about literal demons. It removes demonic ideology, demonic pagan gods, demonic cultures with demonic rituals and demonic traditions and demonic practices. It removes that. And then it begins, Christendom, it places things in order. It sweeps the house clean. So first it empties it of demonic false gods. The house is now empty. Then it puts the house in order. But here's the problem. If a nation then says, okay, thank you, Christendom, for removing those old, tyrannical, evil, wicked gods that oppressed us. Thank you for that. Thank you for liberating us, freeing us, and emptying our house, our national house, from the demonic gods. And thank you for putting everything into order and sweeping it clean. But now we would like you, Christ, we would like you to go as well. We don't want you here either. We want an empty house. Jesus' point is that if you do that, the house won't stay empty. It's not whether the house is filled. It's which deity will it be filled with? You will have Christendom or after Christendom comes in, removes the false gods and puts the house in order. If you remove Christ, then you will have the old gods come back. 
seven times worse than before. And you'll have those old gods now working with a house that's been swept clean and put in order. What do I mean by that in national terms? Well, what has Christendom accomplished? What did it order? I'm talking about medicine, science, government, military-grade weapons, technology, media. These are all the fruits of Christendom. You know that, right, guys? You realize that. Why has the West been so successful with technological advancements, advancements in science and medicine? Because of Jesus. Because all truth is God's truth. Because you're going to make more advancements and discoveries when you believe, when you have the Christian worldview and believe that the world, we can expect to discover certain patterns and systems because it was designed by an orderly God and not the the product of random chaos in evolution, in atheism. It's the Christian worldview that swept the house clean and put it into order. But here's the thing. Not only will you get seven demons now if you remove Christ instead of one, but those seven demons are coming into a clean house, a house that's been ordered. You're talking about demons coming back, but not coming back to a nation that that previously was in the Stone Age or the Bronze Age. You're talking about demons coming back seven times the demons coming back to a nation, a house that now has nuclear weapons, that now has social media, that now has artificial intelligence. (sighs) What will the result be? And how do you stave off that potential danger and threat? What is the standard that you can raise against it? When the enemy comes in like a flood, what is the standard? It's not classical liberalism. It's not democracy or sacred democracy. It's Christ. All of Christ, not just the gospel. That's the tip of the spear, but all of Christ, both law and gospel, to all, apply to all of life, not just our private, pretty little hearts, but all of society, the arts and medicine and government, culture, the whole nine yards, all of Jesus for all of life. That's the standard that the Lord raises against the enemy when he comes in like a flood. It's the only hope we have. I'll start defining our our terms from a Baptist perspective, Christian nationalism as a post-millennial, as someone who holds to general equity theonomy and Kuyperianism and presuppositionalism here in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors. Mercy Meadows Ranch is a family-owned and operated cattle company producing top quality beef in Central Texas. Mercy Meadows Ranch serves families across the nation by supplying beef that is hormone, antibiotic, and vaccine-free. They ship bulk beef nationwide because they want to enable families to take control over a major portion of their food supply. Their vision is to help create a Christian-based parallel economy and community to become your trusted beef supplier in support of a multi-generational family heritage. And because of their bulk beef deposit launch taking place this summer, they are hosting a giveaway to stuff your family's freezer with their grass-fed, grain-finished, beef-raised right on their ranch. Now, to enter the giveaway, go to the link in the description and enter your email and you'll be all set. Mercy Meadows Ranch. Check out their website, mercymeadowsranch.com. With the banking industry in another tailspin and the Fed ready to raise interest rates once again, many of you are probably asking, when does this madness stop? If you're interested in learning how to establish a family banking system outside of today's mainstream banking insanity, then schedule a call with our sponsors at Private Family Banking. There's a way for individuals and families to put their hard-earned money to work continuously accruing compounding interest and have those resources available as collateral for cash or for financing investments, business, college, and other major life expenditures without going to the big banks for loans. Income tax protected, 
safety from stock market losses, guaranteed rates of compounding interest, and the ability to store up an inheritance for your children's children and avoid the death tax on your estate. If this interests you, then email our friends at familybankingnow at gmail.com to schedule a call. Again, that's familybankingnow at gmail.com. Send them an email today. All right. So let me go ahead and start defining some terms. I wrote this um, a few days ago on Twitter in response to another tweet from Scott Annual from uh, G3 Ministries. And I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Nathan, my assistant, pull it up on the screen so that those of you who are watching on YouTube can follow along. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, that's totally fine. I'm going to read it so you'll be, you'll be all right. Um, I said, no more talking past each other. From now on, I am fiercely committed to clarity and providing definitions for my position. Unfortunately, and I will concede right now, many Christian nationalists are um, not being clear. Now, I, I don't think the opponents are being that clear either. Um, but they're not being clear. They're just, we, we want, we just want a Christian nation. What's so bad about that? Well, of course, you know, every Christian you would think, uh, wants a Christian nation. And so that is true. That is a true statement. Um, but what does that mean? And so the Christian nationalists are going to have to do a better job of explaining what, what we mean by that. I know what I mean by that. And that's what I'm going to share with you guys right now, uh, because it's not helpful to just have the little cliche, you know, quips that, that everyone can agree with. You have to be clear about what you mean. Um, so no more talking past each other. I want to be fiercely committed to clarity and providing definitions for my position. Parentheses. Unfortunately, it means that my post will have to be longer. Close parentheses. Scripture clearly prescribes the size of civil government by clearly defining the role of civil government. Because that's one of the objections. This guy's saying, well, we don't like Christian nationalism because we want a small government. Well, within the Christian nationalist perspective, um, the argument really isn't for small or big government. The argument is for government that is exactly the size it's supposed to be as defined by Scripture. Now, how do you get that from Scripture? How do you get the size of government? You get the size of government by limiting the roles of government. So this is what you do biblically. You say, what does scripture say government exists for? What is God's instituted purpose? He's designed for government. And then you determine, okay, to execute not what, what we want government to do, but and not what government wants government to do, but what God wants government to do, then how, how big of a government do we need? And you make sure that the government is no smaller than it needs to be in order to obey God's prescription for government. It, you don't want it any bigger than it needs to be, but you also don't want it any smaller. You want government not to be larger and not to be smaller. You want government to be the exact size it needs to be in order to obey God. That's the concept. Very simple. So first you have to look to well, what does God call, command government to do? And it's very clear. Romans chapter 13, government, civil government, the family, that sphere in society is a government. The church is a government, right? We have familial government. We have ecclesiastical government. But what I'm talking about specifically right now is civil government. The civil government sphere, it has been instituted by God. It's not man's design or man's idea. It was instituted by God himself. It's in scripture and its purpose, the commandment that God has given it, it exists for this reason, is to punish evil and praise the good. Punish evil and praise the good. So that being said, I went on in my tweet. I wrote this scripture clearly prescribes the size of civil government by clearly defining the role of civil government. Punish actual evil, not policing potential evil. Right there, you're going to have a smaller government than what we currently have. Punish actual evil, not policing potential evil. Here's some examples, getting very specific, defining my terms. What that would look like would be no state-run schools. 
No public school. So what does government exist for? To punish evil, not to educate children. Education belongs, we have three spheres, the home, the church, and the state. Education has been given by God to which sphere? The home, familial fathers, the family. Ephesians 6, fathers, not state fathers, but familial fathers, do not exasperate your children, your sons, but rather train them up in the instruction and the paideia, the curriculum, the teaching, the fear of the Lord, the fear and admonition of the Lord. That belongs to fathers. Fathers are called to educate their children. They will do this in tandem, in partnership with the viceroy of the home, which is the mother. This is called homeschooling. I believe it is also biblically permissible to have Christian schools outside of the home, but where fathers and mothers are deeply involved. But the institution that has no authority and no business whatsoever in educating children is the state. They punish evil. They do not educate children. So, the size of civil government, clearly defined by the role of civil government, punishing actual evil, not policing potential evil. This means no state or public schools. This also means no IRS, especially 87,000 extra IRS agents that are armed with guns. No, you don't need that. So are taxes legitimate? Do we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Yes, that's biblical. However, when government gets smaller because it's not doing school, and as we'll see here in a moment, it's not doing welfare, and it's not doing a host of other things that it's not called by God to do, well then, Things cost less, and you can be taxed less. And if you're taxed less, guess what also happens? Taxes can be mu become much more simpler. You don't have to have thousands of laws in tax codes, and you don't have to have a, a, a staff of thousands and thousands of people, namely the IRS, to ensure that the government's getting every single penny that it thinks it's owed. So no state public schools, no IRS. What I would advocate for, again, I'm sharing my position. This doesn't represent everyone under the banner of Christian nationalism. But what I would argue for would be a flat sales tax. No income tax because it's not proportional. I don't believe that someone who works harder and by God's grace has been endowed with superior gifts, at least in the monetary sense, for producing wealth, that that person should be further penalized. So the idea of different tax brackets for the wealthy and for the poor, I don't believe is a biblical notion. A straight sales tax across the board. Now, some people will purchase more than others, but you could be, in theory and in practice, it will work out rather easily, you could be significantly wealthier than your peers and yet live a modest life with your spending and pay no more taxes. Now, the sales tax would have to be significantly higher than it currently is, but it wouldn't be 50% or something like that. It probably would sit around 25 to 35% sales tax. And that would be enough to fund the government to do everything that God says it's supposed to do. It would not be enough to fund the government to do everything it's doing now because it's doing a lot of things that it's not supposed to be doing. But it would be enough to fund the government to be strong, to wield the sword competently and, and strongly with strength, to both punish evil domestically, criminals within our borders, and to defend our borders and to fend off threats of evil from outside foreign threats, a military and police. It would be enough for that. So a straight sales tax. 
No property taxes either. Half of your property taxes, for the record, go towards public schools. Now, you would have to pay for a private school, or you would have to work with a single-income home, which I do believe is God's design for families, and your wife homeschooling your children. But guess what? You'd have a lot more money because you wouldn't be paying near as much in taxes. So, the next, no state schools, no IRS, no state welfare. Provision. So we've talked about education. Which sphere does it belong to? The state? No. The family. Now talking about physical provision. Physical provision belongs, again, to the sphere of the church. No. The family. The family. And the church is a backstop. It functions as a free safety for individual impoverished Christians when their families fail. If someone doesn't work, if a man will not work, the scripture says, let him not eat. So the church doesn't give money to people who are lazy. When it comes to physical provision, I hear people say this all the time. It's a massive biblical misconception. They say, well, the state wouldn't have to be doing welfare if the church would step up its game. That is one of the most ignorant and stupid statements you could make. And if you made that statement, you need to apologize and repent because it's wrong. Now, the reason that the church cannot, cannot um, right now financially uh, handle, carry the burden in the United States of America. There's no way. Why? Well, one, uh, because the church has been depleted. Many have apostatized. Number two, because we have an epidemic of, of people who need provision in our nation far more than we should. Why? Because when the state does something it's not supposed to do, it does it poorly. And the state taking care of welfare and taking that not from the church, but from families, fathers, has incentivized poverty. And so now we have an epidemic of poverty. And the only way that it can be taken care of is by individual familial fathers. Fathers caring for their families, caring for their wives, caring for their children, working hard and making provision. No state welfare. Okay? So then what does the state do? It punishes evil. Now, I said punishing actual evil not policing potential evil. What do I mean by that? I wrote this. That means swift and just retribution. Public hanging or a firing squad. Yes, I'm getting very specific with my terms. I'm going to define my terms. Public hanging or firing squad for capital offense. For capital offense. Not for minor petty crimes, but if somebody murders then yes, they need to lose their life. That's the biblical principle, life for a life. That's in the Noahic covenant. That's in the Mosaic law. That continues throughout in all places, in all times, for all people. A life for a life, that is justice. So for capital crimes, you would receive capital punishment. And that capital punishment shouldn't be sitting on death row for 20 years. It should be a fair trial, it will take some time, but it should be weeks, perhaps months, never years. Never years. A fair trial, weeks, perhaps months, where you have fair opportunity for fair representation as the defendant. All these things take place. But if you are found guilty in a court of law for a capital crime, such as murder, you receive the death penalty and it should be public. What the Bible teaches in terms of justice is this. It says when justice is delayed, that wickedness becomes rampant. Wickedness increases when justice is delayed. So when you think of preventing crime, right? because I said the government exists to punish evil, not for welfare, physical provision, that's the family, not for education, state schools, public schools, that's the family. The government exists 
to punish evil. But then I define my terms even more specifically by saying, um, and that means punishing actual evil. So first you have to have a standard, God's law, for defining what's evil and what's righteous. And it means punishing actual evil, but then I specified even more. This gets an even smaller government. Not policing potential evil. A lot of what we have outside of welfare, that's a ton. IRS agents and crazy tax laws, that's a ton. When you think of government employees, think public school, welfare agencies, and IRS. You get rid of those, you have already substantially whittled down the state. You have. So we are talking about a smaller government than what we currently have, for sure. But not a libertarian idea. Not, not, not small government just for the sake of small government. I want a government that is much smaller than what we currently have, but is absolutely big enough to do what God commands government to do. Now, so we've already whittled it down. We're going to whittle it down even further now. Punishing actual evil not policing potential evil. In biblical law, case law, God's moral law and the civil law given to Israel, the principle that we see is this. You don't see you don't see officers going around policing, investigating, snooping, looking for crime. <clears throat> Instead what you have is that when crime is known, when it's actually been committed, they're brought before the judges. A fair trial is had. Evidence has to be presented. Eyewitnesses, and more than one, two to three independent lines of eye and ear witness testimony. When all those things have been done, if a person is found guilty, then they're swiftly punished. The punishment is proportional for the crime. It's impartial. Doesn't matter what ethnicity they are. And it's swift. It's swift. And then how do you prevent? Well, you police over here with all these people to prevent future. No, that's the beauty. You kill two birds with one stone. Swift proportional justice prevents future crimes. It does. The greatest preventing measure, the greatest, the, the most effective method for preventing crime is not having a bunch of, of, of police force going around policing potential crime. Now, the best method, biblically speaking, for preventing, for, for um, um, dissuading the population from committing outward manifestations of evil is for them to see what happens. Swift, proportional, unbiased, impartial justice when evil is per uh, perpetrated. It, there's a reason why there were public hangings in the past. And it wasn't, it wasn't to be, um, it, it wasn't to be cruel and it, and it wasn't to be, uh, to embrace uh, gore, right? And, and for the record, in a theonomic Christian nationalist society, and you don't have to be a theonomist to be a Christian nationalist, but I am, I'm arguing my position, in that kind of society, um, nobody's forced to go. So when I say that there's public hangings or a public firing squad for capital crimes, I'm not saying um, that the public is forced to attend it. But I'm saying that these things happen in the public square, ideally in front of a courthouse. So wherever the crime was committed in that county, the county seat, that courthouse, there would be a gallow and that person would be publicly punished. If you're a parent, with young children that you don't want to see that, perfectly understandable, you don't have to attend. But there is public justice being carried out swiftly, swiftly. And that's one of the primary means of preventing future crimes. Continuing now, this deters crime and it decreases the need for policing. Um, and it would also abolish the majority of prisons. Why? Because you have capital punishment, not death row, not feeding a murderer for 20 years on our tax dollars. You have capital punishment for capital crimes. Then for lesser crimes, for lesser crimes, um, if it's theft, which would be a common crime, you have double retribution. You pay them back. 
the person who steals pays back. And if it's not theft, let's say it's abuse, some kind of assault, something like that. It's not murder, but it's also not theft. Then you would have, and I know this is controversial, but think with me for a moment. Just think. It's not whether, but which. You're going to have something, some kind of penalty. What you would have is not a public hanging if it's not a capital offense, but you would have, and not retribution if it's not stealing. What you would have is certain fines. There would be fines for some crimes. And in some cases, not many, but in some cases, you would have a public beating. Not a flogging, but a public beating. And again, it would be public. Not whether, but which. What's the alternative, guys? Oh, it's so much more humane and it grants so much more dignity to take a full-grown adult, adult man and treat him like a pet, put him in a cage, give him a little water bowl and a food tray three times a day, a little potty area, and a little bed. I have a pet tortoise for my, my three girls. They love it. Um, my tortoise's cage looks like your average prison cell. That's how you treat a pet, not a human being, even a criminal who's been made in the image of God. No, you, you know what's demeaning, degrading, dehumanizing, and robbing of dignity? Prison. Prison is. And again, by what standard? Whose definition do we accept? Is it God's or is it progressive evolved man and what he thinks is dehumanizing and what he thinks grants dignity? Well, of course, he thinks in our culture today that's apostatizing from Christ and from God. Of course, he thinks that, that uh, free shelter and free food is the way to go. In fact, that, that <laughs> think about this for a second. That, that is what our progressive Democrats are arguing for all of us, not just criminals, you'll own nothing and be happy. Everyone will get their little cell and you'll have universal income and universal housing from cradle to grave, universal education. Everything's paid for by the state. Everything's covered. What they want to do with criminals, what they are doing with criminals, they want to do with the entire population because they think that that's good and that's the goal that people would just be taken care of like pets. Like people can't actually produce. Men can't actually take care of their family. It's, that, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations, as Thomas Sowell and others have said. So yeah, to take a man out to the courthouse publicly and to beat him with rods because of a crime that he's committed that does not deserve capital punishment, but is serious, and then to say, don't do it again. And now you're free to enter back into society, to be productive, and to live a meaningful life. That is far more, far more dignifying than what we currently do. Again, this whole conversation, where is it coming from? Returning to God's law, general equity theonomy, post-millennialism, the thing, optimistic eschatology that maybe things could improve, they could get better, Christian nationalism, let's be a Christian nation. Where's the conversation coming from? It's not whether, but which. This isn't, this isn't an ivory tower conversation, but some guys are having it in, in that way. They're having it from an ivory tower. No, we're having this conversation. I'm having this conversation from, from the position of, of the current insanity that we're, that, that we're living in presently. Saying, surely, surely uh, when, when they're castrating little boys, maybe we could have a, another conversation about Greg Bonson and, and theonomy. Are we ready for it now? Westminster Escondido wasn't ready for it then. I mean, listen to that, that speech. It's like a two-minute clip from Greg Bonson. It's powerful. Where he says, we're locking our windows at night because the way that school that the crime is skyrocketing and you guys want want to anathematize theonomy at Westminster Escondido they silence Greg Monson you you've got 
these heresies creeping into the church and you want to talk about theonomy? We've got this going on in our society and in our culture and you want to talk about theonomy? It's a powerful clip from Greg Monson. My question, just a little old me, Joel Webin, my, my, my question is just, are we ready to have the conversation now? Westminster Escondido was very clear that they were not ready to have the conversation with Bonson 20, 30 years ago. I'm wondering now, in 2023, after churches were locked down by the government, after poison was mandated to be jabbed, injected into people's arms, after drag queen story hour for kids, after pornography in public libraries for kids, after six million dead in the womb, I'm just wondering now, could we talk about some of the stuff that that these guys tried to talk about earlier? Are, are we ready to be honest now? Have we taken off the rose glasses now? Can we consider? Where the, again, I'm being honest here. Will there be problems? Will there be things that we'll have to figure out? Yeah. But what's the alternative? What is the alternative? And you cannot present as a, as a legitimate alternative a placeholder. And that's all classical liberalism ever was. It's a placeholder. As two ships are passing each other in the night, as Christendom is going out, as paganism is co coming in, it gave the appearance and the temporary appearance of neutrality. But neutrality is a myth. All I'm asking is, are we ready to have that conversation now? Can we admit as Christians, as brothers in Christ, that neutrality is a myth and that, and that the state is going to wield power because it's commanded by God to do so. It's been given a sword by God. And so is it going to wield that sword according to God's standards or according to pagan standards? So, going on. Governments should only be as big as as it needs to be for the size of the domestic population, as well as the size of foreign military threats. So how, how big should a government be? Big enough, given the size of the population of that nation, big enough to punish domestic evil within the population, to guard its borders, police its borders, and to have a military that is prepared for foreign threats. There's your government because that's all government exists for. That's all that I'm arguing. Now, that being said, in terms of domestically punishing citizens for crimes, we do have to have a conversation about how, what standard do we use for determining crimes? If government exists to punish evil, we have to be able to define what is evil. So let me continue. All of this is still accomplished, I believe, with a clear separation of church and state. That's another thing. Within my understanding, my little neck of the woods of Christian nationalism, what I'm arguing for, my position, is a clear separation of, of, of church and state. And to be fair, I don't know anyone in the Christian nationalist side of the argument uh, that says otherwise. I don't know one person. Stephen Wolf, he's a Thomist. He's not presuppositional, Fantilian. He, he would hold to Aquinas. He's Presbyterian. I'm Baptist. He's not the biggest fan of theonomy. He's an optimistic all mill. I'm post mill. Plenty of differences between us. But Stephen Wolf is very clearly his position separation of church and state, two independent, autonomous, sovereign spheres. So we're not talking about an ecclesiocracy. Now, this is where we need to, this is another thing where I think we're talking past each other. We're missing this, okay? No one within the Christian nationalist side of the debate is arguing for an ecclesiocracy. That would be a church-run state, or as our G3 brothers like to, to say, a Protestant pope. They've asked us about that several times. Um, not once have we ever advocated for that. And they know that. So we're not talking about a, a 
a state, uh, um, a church run state with an, an ecclesiastical authoritative figure who sits in authority over the state. No ecclesiocracy. Okay. So government should only be as big as it needs to be. Um, all this can be accomplished with a clear separation of church and state. But here's the kicker. Absolutely no separation of Christ and state. Every government, get this, every government is theocratic. Every government is a theocracy. It's not whether but which. Every nation has a God. So, there is a massive difference between a theocracy and an ecclesiocracy. An ecclesiocracy is where there is no separation between the sphere of the church and the state, and you have a state that is run by an ecclesiastical figure, by the church. That's an ecclesiocracy. That, the Christian nationalist, is not advocating for, but stands firmly against. However, separation of church and state, good. Separation of Christ and state, bad. And while we're at it, that means a theocracy. We don't want Christ to be separated from the state, which means we want a theocracy. Not an ecclesiocracy, church-run state, but a theocracy, Christ-run state. A Christian state. Now, what would that Christian state look like? What would be some of its theological distinctives? Well, for one, it would be creedal at the federal level, not confessional. Something like the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Athanasius' Creed, not confessional. So it is not, we, the United States of America, are Presbyterian, holding to the Westminster. No. Or we, the United States, are Baptist or Lutheran or Anglican. No. It would be a pan-Protestant uh, pan Protestant nation because I'm arguing again for Christian nationalism. And Catholicism, I believe, denies the gospel. So when I say Christian nationalism, I mean a pan-Protestant movement. A pan-Protestant movement but not a particular denomination within, at a confessional level, within Protestantism, but rather a creedal commitment, a creedal allegiance at the federal level. So it would be, we the United States are Christian. And what do we all agree with? We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Virgin Mary, are born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified and died, was buried. He rose again on the third day from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will return to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the invisible and universal church, the Holy Spirit, and the invisible and universal church, lowercase c, Catholic church, uh, the forgiveness of sins, the communion of the saints, uh, the, the life, uh, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Got a little bit out of order there, but that's the basic gist. My point is a creedal commitment is something that every Protestant Christian can affirm. Every Protestant Christian can affirm. So what do we mean by no separation of Christ and state? It means that the state is Christian. What do we mean the, the state is Christian? We mean there's a public allegiance. All right? One nation, indivisible, under God. Under God. We're saying that. Uh, but we're saying that with a little bit more specificity. Which God? The triune God. The Christian God. Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, we're not going to get too specific to where we're now splitting denominations. But within this pan-Protestant project, we're going to say, well, what we'll tell you about Jesus for certain at the federal level is this, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He was crucified and he died and he bodily rose from the grave and he ascended to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. That's what we're advocating for. That's, that's what we mean. Okay. So now, the church has been given the keys, word, sacrament, church discipline. The state has been given the sword, 
executing earthly justice. The important question is whether or not the moral law, that would be all Ten Commandments, is merely um, is merely for Christian people or for all people. And that's the big question. And, and you know, we're figuring this out, having to argue about this as brothers in Christ. But the Christian nationalist position is that the state should legislate all Ten Commandments, not just the second table of the law, as it's been called, Commandments 5 through 10, dealing with our love for neighbor, but also the first table of the law, Commandment 1 through 4, dealing with our love for God. You shall have no other gods before me. What would be an example right now of something that, that would not be permitted in a Christian nation if we returned, if this Christian nationalism project worked out? Well, one thing that would not be allowed is right now, I believe it's Minneapolis or Minnesota. Or uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the same thing. Uh, I, I can't remember the city, but but an article just came out that they just had a ruling that they're going to have um, an Islamic call to prayer five times a day. That they're actually going to have a siren um, citywide, citywide um, that is uh, Islam and it's public. Um, so you can't have, you know, Christian nationalism, but it's Minneapolis, but you can have Muslim nationalism. So when I say a Christian nation, a public allegiance, creedal, the Apostles' Creed at the, at the federal level, um, what I'm saying is we're holding all 10 of the commandments. And what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean, remember everything I've said thus far about not policing, it doesn't mean that you're going into people's private homes to see if they're worshiping a false god. It means in the public square, there are no high places. There are no high places. There are no altars built to the false gods. So, so what's something, that, that an example that would not be permitted? Um, a call to Muslim prayer. Citywide. Yes, that would be illegal. And if somebody did it anyways, that would be a crime. And it would be punishable. And we would have to work through and understanding what that punishment is. Taking the general equity of the civil law, applying it, looking at penalties, but understanding this is case law, many of those penalties, for the record, that's another thing we need to understand. Well, well the penalty for idolatry is death. I understand. One of the things that we also need to understand in this conversation about God's law with, with nations adhering to it and civilly, uh, at the civil level legislating it in this gospel age is we need to understand um, that there is something to be said for maximum penalties. So in the state of Texas, you know, you'll, you'll see a sign. I forget the exact number, but, you know, um, if you litter, right, it's a uh, um, penalty up to two years in prison and a uh, $5,000 fine. Now, I don't know hardly anyone in Texas that's thrown a, a wad of paper out, out their car window and, and is currently serving hard time in prison, is in jail for two years. It's a maximum penalty. It's legal under the law. It could happen, but it rarely does. But it's there for what? For big littering and more likely for repeat offenders. So it's one thing to say, um, well, homosexuality biblically should be punished by death. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is a maximum penalty. That's a maximum penalty. We don't have one historic account from all the historic writings, biblical and extra biblical, of Israel ever stoning a son for dishonoring his father. But that was one of the laws. That was one of the laws. This is a maximum offense, and that's not because Israel didn't obey in that instance. They had plenty of disobedience, but that's not the reason why. This is a maximum penalty. One, with real penalties, evil is deterred. Uh, uh, it, it, it deters evil. It dissuades people from doing that which is sinful. So that's one. And then number two, there are repeat offenders. And three, what we're primarily talking about is the distinction between sin and crimes. 
right? So even with the second table of the law, well, the 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet. We're not going to have the coveting police. Somebody's not going to be in jail for coveting. It's a sin, but it's not a crime. Now, there, there are multiple factors at play, but the chief one, the big rule of thumb to consider when determining a sin and a crime, the difference between the two, is private versus public. Private versus public. So public idolatry, having a, a Buddhist temple erected, that would be a crime in a Christian nation. Um, a citywide call to uh, Islamic prayer would be a crime in a Christian nation. Uh, now talking about homosexuality, going back to that, a gay pride parade is a crime. Drag queen story hour is a crime. Um, pornography would be a crime. Um, pornography in, in schools for children, of course, would be a crime. Somebody privately doing something like homosexuality, sodomy, um, that would certainly be a sin, but not necessarily a crime that's punishable. Now, if that came out to light, then there would be um, a punishment for that offense, but it would likely not be treated as a capital offense, and it would not receive capital punishment. That would be your maximum penalty, right? Just like littering, maximum two years in prison, $5,000 fine. That would be maximum. What would likely happen is that would be one of those instances where an individual would be beaten. And it would be shameful, like what I was talking about earlier, beaten by rods. He would be told not to do this again. If somebody was brazen and a repeat offender and trying to, to, to do it in public, just to stick it to Christians, then yes, eventually, eventually, with a repeat offender who's also becoming more and more publicly brazen with his sin, then yes, even the sin of homosexuality would eventually get the death penalty. Okay, so now all the things that I'm saying right now, just for the record, I'm not saying that I'm 100% right about all these things. I'm doing my best to study the Word of God first and foremost. I'm doing my best to, to study political um, theology, political theory from old dead guys and not the loser guys that are alive today. Um, and I'm studying guys like Rush Dooney and Gary North and the Re Reconstructionist and, and Theonomist. And I agree with much of their position. I would have some differences here and there. I don't know exactly how all this works out. But again, for those who are just tuning in, the way I started the episode, go back and check it out. Here's the key. Here's the big idea. It's not whether but which. It's not whether but which. We can either have the fierce debates about drag queen story hour and castrating little boys. Chemically castrating. Sexual mutilation. 60 million babies aborted in their mother's womb. Pornography in schools. Right? We're either going to have a conversation about that or we can have a conversation and try to figure out Sabbath laws and blasphemy laws in a Christian nation. It's either Christian nationalism or tranny nationalism. And even that's not true. It won't be nationalism at all. It'll be tranny globalism. It'll be it's the global homo jihad or it's Christian nationalism. Because the only way you cast out the darkness is not with less darkness, but with light. And Jesus is the only light of the world. His law is good. It's the lamp. The law of God is a light. It doesn't save us. No man will be saved by works as done unto the law. The gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, first for the Jew, then for the Greek. The gospel of free grace, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, is the only means of salvation, eternal salvation for an individual man. Yes and amen a thousand times. But even the law of God is spoken of as light. Where? In Scripture. Your law is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. Lawless nations become dark. The law gives light. The law, first, it reveals our need for a Savior.
It shows us the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the, the infinite chasm in between God and man and our need for the only mediator. There is one God and one mediator, the God-man Christ Jesus. So the law drives us to Christ in its first use. In its third use, it's a compass that guides us and shows us where to go. The law also has a, um, it, it's a tutor, the, the pedagogical use of, of the law, that it teaches, and it doesn't just teach individual Christians, but it teaches whole societies made up even of non-Christians. The law disciples a culture in terms of morality. What's right? What's wrong? And that's what I want guys to get. And that's probably where I'll land the plane here at the end. I want guys to understand that it's both and. So as somebody who is post-millennial, okay, as someone who's post-millennial, um, I believe that uh, at the end of this gospel age, this church age, there will be more people saved than not. That heaven will have more people than hell. Read B.B. Warfield. I understand. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. Difficult the path. Few under, ever find it. Um, I've talked about that before. I don't have time to talk about that right now. Um, check out B.B. Warfield and other post-millennials. Um, there are easy biblical interpretations of that particular parable if that's what you're hung up on. Many of us have just assumed that hell will have a hundred times more people than heaven. Um, I believe that that's wrong. And there's a very, there's very clear, faithful, biblical ways of dealing with that. Okay. Of dealing with the verses that, that make it allude to the sense that hell will far outpopulate heaven. Right now, for the record, I do believe that hell outpopulates heaven. But as a post-millennial, I believe that you know, the leaven will work through the batch of dough. The mustard seed grows into a tree that fills the earth. The stone cut by no human hands will grow into a mountain filling the earth. And that more and more and more and more there will be um, not just uh, the expanse of Christendom in Christian culture, uh, but there will also be an increase, uh, a, a massive increase in individual Christian people in terms of regeneration, true, eternal Christian people. I believe that. And so, on the one hand, a Christian nation, Christian nationalism, whatever you want to call it, it will not happen apart from the bottom up. Bottom up, meaning we need, James White has said this, I agree, we need more regenerate hearts. We need more churches, more gospel preaching. Uh, we need more of uh, Christians being faithful and doing the work of an evangelist. Uh, we need more salvation, more regeneration. But here's where I would disagree with some of my brothers in Christ. And I would say it's not either or, it's both and. It is bottom up. We need more Christians. It is also top down. And I'll leave you with this. 3% of the population, namely the LGBT jihad, 3%, not anymore. They're not 3% anymore. But 3% of the total population, less than 3% at the time, with a strategic, calculated plan to execute patiently and slowly over decades, they won the entire nation. So don't tell me that a minority of faithful Christians can't make a difference. Sodomites did. I'd like to think that, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is more potent and more powerful than sodomy. 3% of the population, less than 3%, they made a deliberate, intentional, strategic plan to accomplish over the course of 40, 50, 60 years. <clears throat> and they did it. And now all of, of America just assumes that same-sex mirage is virtuous and moral. You need moral people, truly moral people. And that comes from regenerate people. And if you're going to get regenerate people, you need preaching, gospel preaching. And if you're going to get that, you need preachers and you need churches. Yes and amen. You need that. And yet, at the same time, at the same time, the law teaches. It's, it's, it's both and. 
you've heard it said politics is downstream of culture. Okay. But then explain to me where we're at as a culture on the LGBT craziness in relation to a Burgerfell. A Burgerfell was a Supreme Court ruling. So there you have politics, state, government, making, rendering a judgment. And then you see the culture is already heading towards sexual insanity. But whew, look at it statistically. Look, look, it, it, it exponentially expedited in terms of uh, we, 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 we went from same sex marriage should be legal to drag queen story hour in like 15 minutes. That's not a coincidence. Because politically, politics is downstream of culture. If you have a, a culture that's not moral, you can have bad laws. At the same time, though, when you have bad laws, it also, it, it's a cycle. It's a vicious cycle. It makes the, the, the culture become even more immoral. And so what I'm arguing for, and the Christian nationalists that, that I would say that I, I, yeah, I'm linking arms with these brothers. I think they're good guys. I think they're solid. My particular strain would be the post-millennial general the, theonomic vein. Some of these guys are all millennial. Um, some of them are classic pre-mill. Uh, some of them are theonomic. Some of them aren't. Some of them are presuppositional, Mantillian. Some of them are more uh, Thomistic and, and a bigger fan of you know, natural law and these kinds of things from, from Aquinas. But one of the things that we all agree on is uh, the nation must be Christian. It must be Protestant, a pan-Protestant Christian nation. It should be creedal, not confessional. So it's not discriminating between denominations. Creedal, something all Protestant Christians can agree on at the federal level. And it must be, it must uh, punish evil and praise the good and the state not be any bigger than that. And then with evil, how do you define it? The Ten Commandments. I get there as a theonomist. Other guys get there from natural law. Either way, it's the Ten Commandments. And what does it look like to, to legislate and enforce the Ten Commandments? Well, it looks like having a, a good grasp of the distinction between sins and crimes. A lot of that being defined by the, the, the nature, the difference between private and public. Understanding case law, understanding the Bible, prescribing penalties as maximum penalties for repeat offenders who are brazen in public with their sin. Um, and then understanding uh, with the first table of the law, like the Sabbath, for instance, the state cannot mandate a day of worship because only God can command the heart of God, regenerate the heart of God to where it can truly worship. But the state can mandate and enforce a day of rest. That's what a Sabbath law is. It doesn't force people to worship the triune God. But what it does is it closes down businesses. So don't think, um, <laughs> when you think about Sabbath laws, don't think about a police officer tying someone up and forcing them to say Christ is Lord. What you should think about in Christian nationalistic terms with Sabbath laws is you should think about Chick-fil-A. That's what we mean. That's what we're talking about. A day of rest. But it's one that is actually enforced by the state. I will admit that. So it's not just the, the, the independent private business, their decision, like Chick-fil-A, to take off Sunday. But the, the state is saying um, you're not allowed to open on Sunday. Now, that being said, <laughs> with Sabbatarianism, we still hold to uh, works of necessity and works of mercy. So there would be hospitals open on the Sabbath. There would still be um, electricity available on, on the Sabbath. Um, there, there would still be the uh, fire department and certain police. It would be maybe a skeleton crew at some, some level. Um, and certain, you know, working in certain shifts and, and doing these kind of things to be able to cut back. Um, but yes, works of mercy and works of necessity for emergency would still be open on the Sabbath. 
and it would not take society long to be able to function with a six-day work week. We don't think that way right now because we're antinomian. We're lawless. Christians even are antinomian and lawless. We don't think about preparing for the Sabbath. But you can live that way if you're intentional. So, all that being said, the last thing is just this, is it bottom up or top down? All the Christian nationalists that I know, that I'm talking to, guys who would wear that hat, there's differences in our theology, I've already expressed that, but all they're saying is it's both. It's both. And, and I would agree. It's both. We need to preach the gospel. We need more churches. We need more evangelism because we need more Christians. We need more regenerate hearts. But here's the deal. That's not all we need. That's not all we need. Because 3% of the population with sodomites were able to change everything. And we've got some regenerate hearts. Do we have a lot of guys who are professing to be Christians that aren't actually Christians because of nominal Christianity in America? Yes, that's a thing. I understand. It is a thing. But we still have some regenerate hearts, truly Christian people in America. We do. And I would be willing to argue that we have a lot more than 3%. Even if we're talking about truly regenerate Christians in America, I believe it's still greater than 3% of the population. So we need more, but we also need to educate and disciple the regenerate Christians we already have. And part of their discipleship needs to be this, that Christians are not called by Jesus to constantly lose. That's the problem. We need more Christians, but we also need to educate the Christians we already have, that they are allowed to wield power. The Bible, the biblical principle in regards to ruling is not that Christians can't rule, not that ruling or wielding power is inherently evil. The biblical principle when it comes to ruling and when it comes to power is that we must rule righteously. A husband is a servant ruler. But make no mistake, he is a king. He is a ruler in his home. Peter even says that Sarah called her husband Lord, not Lord of Lords. That title belongs to Jesus alone, but lowercase l, Lord, Lord in his home. The gospel does not call Christian husbands to not be Lords who rule with real authority in their homes. What the Christian gospel calls us to do instead as husbands is to rule righteously, not to abdicate power, but to wield it righteously, not to not lead, but to lead like Jesus does. Jesus is the head of the church. He nourishes the church. He laid his life down for the church, but he's also in authority over the church. He tells the church what to do. He does. That's all I think Christian nationalists are saying is we want the nation to be publicly and explicitly have an allegiance to Christ Jesus. Not just theism, but the Christian God, the triune God. We want that to be Protestant. We want it to be creedal, not confessional. And we want the state to be small enough to stop doing the things God never told it to do, like welfare and education, but big enough to effectively do what God has called it to do, which is to wield the sword against evil. And to do that, we have to define evil, which means by what standard. And if we don't use the standard of scripture, then you get tranny nationalism, drag queen story hour. And so, yeah, given that as the alternative, we prefer Christian nationalism. That there's a standard to define evil, and it should be the Ten Commandments, God's moral law. And yes, that does include the first four of those commandments, the first table of the law. And how do you do that in a nation where there will inevitably be non-Christians as citizens a part of it? Well, you distinguish between crimes and sins, public and private, 
and figuring that out, albeit with inevitably plenty of mistakes, plenty of casualties, all of that is vastly superior to what we have now. And that's where I hang my hat. That's why I'm here. Because it's not whether, but which. We can argue as a nation about how to enforce the Sabbath. Or we can argue as a nation over breastfeeding men. You choose. Thanks for tuning in.